Okay, so um, yeah, my talk is about uh, Monte Carlo simulations on GPU. And uh, first, a short overview. I will first talk about um, surface growth and physical aging a bit, uh, which is basically also surface growth the main application of the application I am showing to you. Uh, even though we also then use it for different things like quartz models and uh, so basically spin systems. And there's also another applica possible application which I will hint at. Um, then I will talk about Lattice Monte Carlo, which is the type of simulation we're using to study um, surface growth, uh, the surface growth model, and the aging of this uh, in this non-equilibrium system. And then, in terms of uh, technical details, I will talk about uh, trivial parallelism versus SIMT. Like basically, how can you, when you in your problem, you have um, trivial parallelism? How can you use it? Uh, to uh, efficiently use the SIMT concept you find on uh, GPUs. Uh, first, a bit about the stochastic processes. Um, see, um, many of these many processes in nature are driven by stochastic processes, and some lead to self-organization, which are the most interesting. But some, um, but the surface growth we are studying is not self-organizing. Just to show some ex um, examples of these driving processes, we see at different scales here processes driving uh, basically matter or phases uh, in such a way that they separate uh, via spironodal decomposition into these uh, spinodal structures. It can happen at the universal scale, can happen at microscopic scale, in just a solid mixture. Uh, you have driven system where you have a system where you have an external force, like wind impinging on a surface and so, um, forming ripples. For example, dunes in a desert or as again, you can have the same thing, uh, basically the same driving force or similar driving force, but you shoot ions at the surface and you get uh, ripples and they have a driven system out of equilibrium. Uh, similar simulations, um, or so I suppose this is also, also interesting in game theory, especially evolutionary game theory, where they can be used in different processes and to, to study different phenomena. And all of these things are things that can be also well studied by uh, lattice Monte Carlo simulations because you can easily model with these simulations the underlying stochastic processes. So um, I want to give you a short primer about non-equilibrium versus equilibrium simulations or also what you could call uh, simulations which are uh, dynamical simulations. Like for example, you start with a disordered state, for example, in a spin system, like in an Isaac model for example, or here, POTS model, and then you see how the domains grow when you are in the disordered phase. Um, but when you want to do an out of equilibrium system, the thing that's actually important to you is to, um, to um, investigate the, how the evolution works. So what are the different evolution steps? You don't really care about what happens in the end at infinite times in this uh, kind of setting. Um, so you, you really want to have an implementation, an algorithm which reproduces what, you, uh, what the physical evolution of a system would be. Uh, sometimes you see, especially in the context of spin systems like Ising models, you see um, um, the opposite question where you basically want to know the equilibrium properties or in some out of equilibrium systems you want to see, know the, about the steady state properties. And they just want to know what happens in the end. You don't care about how it gets there, the system, as long as you can show that this is uh, basically, you will get the correct final, final state. And here you basically change the evolution uh, to get at your equilibrium state uh, rather quickly. But in my talk, I focus uh, solely on the outer equilibrium properties. So they are so actually to discover the um, uh, dynamical properties of systems. For example, uh, here, what is the focus of this talk? The surface growth processes, where you start out at a flat surface, and then you, in this case, you, in this model, we de randomly deposit particles to the surface. And these particles stick, and the surface roughens over time. Basically. So this is then the transient state with the surface growth. You see a log-log plot here, so you can see the, the straight line is a power log growth. And then we have this state up here, which is the steady state where the surface, surface doesn't roughen anymore. And this is what we're not interested in. So usually, um, and this is basically just a finite size effect because the system in our simulation cell isn't infinite. And so one thing we focus is also important in these simulations is that we don't get into this regime here. We want to study this one as long as possible, but we want to avoid the steady state, which means we need large system size. We need to simulate large system sizes. Even though we can reduce noise by averaging over many simulations, we still need large systems to avoid, avoid the steady state. And also you can see this other example of phase separation here in a 3D case where you also have spinodal decomposition. It's some technical application for that. Um, 
So how do we do this on a GPU? Uh, there are basically two ways to do this. One thing is um, that are relevant to the to get dynamical properties. At least um, there's for, for one the option of using a stochastic cellular automaton, where you basically use a checkerboard decomposition of a lattice if you have a bipartite lattice. Uh, for example, here a simple square lattice, and then you update all odd sides and then all even sides, basically, with some added noise, so you do kind of to emulate random side selection to get the um, thermodynamic noise back into the system. And this is basically really efficient, so it's very simple to implement, uh, gets you, uh, usually at least, and then uh, you can optimize a lot. And you have memory linear memory, linear memory accesses. You, yeah, on CPU, you could use caches very well. On GPU, you can really well work with your SIMT structure on the um, device, and you will get really, really fast. The other way is random sequential updates. That's basically how you would uh, basically imagine kind of nature does it. You have updates which are statistically independent from each other. So what we need to do in simulation is basically select sites at random, single sites at random, update the site, and then select another site afterwards, and these updates need to be uncorrelated. On GPU, we do this using domain decomposition. So we cut our system into finite sized domains. And then we have this independent, um, uh, structure, these independent domains, where we can then randomly choose sites in these domains, update there. And so in this 2D example here, two by two, basically you have four different workers you can, that can work on this system as it looks there. Um, in terms of performance, I won't go into very much details about these implementations because I want to talk about the triple parallelism versus IMT in the end. Um, so what you see is random sequential, which is actually the better simulation, and I will get to why. Um, this um, gives you like nine billion update attempts per second we can perform on this um, uh, particle deposition model. If you use a stochastic cell automaton uh, with the right settings, we can basically get it to be memory bound on our GPU to get 229 billion updates, update attempts per second. So basically, the, um, as you can see, the stochastic cell automaton is much faster than the random sequential, which, um, um, yeah, is mostly because of the implementation details of the random sequential, because of what, how much work you need to do to actually make it to run and to have it uh, be it really uncorrelated. And just a short overview about this. Um, basically, we put our system here into the global memory of the device, and we apply domain decomposition so we can update parts of the domains. This is double tiling, which I showed before. We can load the domains into the shared memory of multiprocessors, where we can then update them. To avoid correlations, uh, this uh, decomposition origin is then logically shifted after each sweep of over the whole system. So these uh, borders don't always remain on this, at the same place to where they would always accumulate errors in the same places at the system, in the system. Uh, and then we do the same type of domain decomposition again to thread it over threads. It gets a bit complicated because you have really small domains here. You need to be careful not to introduce uh, correlations, which we can see in the end. So, okay, uh, now basically explain to you why random sequential updates are hard. And what I need to do is now to convince you that actually we need to do them, and sometimes at least, because as you just saw, basically using the stochastic cell automaton approach would be much faster and much easier. Um, so dynamical properties and aging are basically the thing you want to uh, use this for. Uh, this is the um, uh, autocorrelation function of a lattice gas, which is basically part of the um, site of the deposition model. And the position model we are, um, I was just uh, talking about. And you can see here in the system, again, this is a log-log plot. The autocorrelation function over time uh, decays as a power law. Basically. So you wait until some waiting time s, and then always compare later states of the system with this initial state and it decays to zero, basically. So this is a basically correct simulation. And if we do the same run using a stochastic cell automaton, we see this. So that's not exactly correct. You see that it reaches a finite value here, but um, then we know that it's correlated, basically, because we always do odd even, so basically the odd even updates. So we can think of maybe there's just a constant correlation, some pattern which always remains, but the universal properties might not be changed. So it's just, we can, just determine this offset here and subtract it, and then we see this, which um, is still not the right thing, basically. So actually, when we do this here, we edit the simulation, we have the simulation with the correlations, and we see that 
there is actually a, a different power law decay for our autocorrelation function in this lattice gas model, which is just direct diffusion of particles, which is now no longer happening in the same way as it would happen when we do random sequential updates. And if you want to, for example, determine this exponent correctly, then this data doesn't really help us. Um, so this is why we know need to do the slow simulation. Um, I just want to give you um, uh, some more details about the model, which I was talking about. So you see the surface growth model. And the actual thing what happened is called the octahedral model, where we do have this lattice gas, which in a 2D case, um, which we are looking at here, um, we have basically system, um, particles, which are representing the up and down slopes of our surface. So basically, it's like the first derivative of the surface, in a way, which is restricted to be only plus or minus one at each lattice side. And these particles are diffusing effectively along x and along y direction, depending on whether it's an x or a y slope. And in the end, uh, when we do these updates, it basically models this um, stochastic differential equation called the KPZ equation. Uh, which is an out of equilibrium system and cannot be solved analytically, especially. So and the noise here is then in this model only given by or only introduced into the system by the random side selection. That's where we don't want to have the correlation because here it should be uncorrelated Gaussian noise. And one really basic property of this is the growth exponent. So this is basically the exponent of this power law growth, but just the slope of our curve here between if we plot it in a log-log scale. Uh, this growth exponent uh, has been investigated uh, sometimes and of, over quite some while until since the um, system or the KPZ equation was uh, basically written down first. Uh, first, top, um, one early hypothesis was if it was one quarter, but then later we could show, or it was also shown in different things, but this is one of our publication here, also using these uh, early sim GPU simulations, could conclusively show that it's actually below one quarter. So we do have a different val a value for beta, and it does not um, work with the finite, this is uh, like a mean field approximation that we get, uh, which leads to one quarter. Um, and then there was a recent paper about uh, this that basically said, okay, when we go to a different model, as I told you, we only have this model where we go plus minus one, and this, um, which restricts um, the simulation a bit, uh, while we could also think of other models where we have larger, side, larger differences allowed between neighboring lattice sites. There was a correlation, um, a publication, sorry, that um, uh, claimed that actually, well, if you go to a large, where more relaxed restriction on the neighboring lattice site heights, um, then you would go back to one quarter, actually, and the beta would be different. Um, now we have a problem um, that we actually need more states in our simulation uh, if we want to actually check this with our GPU simulations and to this degree of accuracy. And as you saw before, this tiny domain, the domain composition with the tiny cells uh, it's only possible because we have to basically these up and down slopes, which are only only by one bit of state. To do n equals ten, like a side difference equals ten, we do need more bits. Like we need four bits. That's kind of huge uh, if you want to have still some performance because uh, we cache in shared memory, and shared memory is really small. Um, so, and now we get to the part where we solve the problem basically by using the taking advantage of the fact we have triple parallelism in our problem because we want to have a smooth uh, function which you want to measure, measure by actually averaging over many simulations. And current, before we are always doing this thing by having large simulations running on one simulator and one GPU and then averaging over many independent runs. Um, so the thing with the trivial parallelism is we want to have good uh, large samples or then another application that you might um, think of like um, if you want to have uh, like these uh, phase, separation phase separation studies where you want to scan a large, uh, large parameter set basically you want to know yeah, um, what kind of initial conditions do you need to reach a certain, certain state after a certain time in your evolution so you don't want to do a parameter study or you want to do um, yeah, test our initial conditions, or you want to do like a response function where you also have you compare basically different initial conditions of systems. And 
and still you need random site, want to have some random site selection in order to get your dynamical properties right. And the idea here, which is here we use this uh, multi-surface approach, which was uh, already invented in 1988 for vector processors. It was a time where vector processors existed before they kind of vanished and then they kind of came back in, term, in, um, in the form of GPUs because they are actually vector processors. Um, so what we want to uh, what we then have is we have basically a vector or state or single letter sites. It's replaced by a vector of like a number of layers basically. So we have a vector which goes a letter site which contains information about not one system, the point in one system, but about uh, points in a large stack of vectors. That's why it's called multi-surface because we just stack surfaces in this application. We can think of stacking surfaces on top of each other and then processing them as a stack. And we can have random accesses to these vectors in our in global memory of the GPU. We don't need to cache anything because when the vectors are long enough, long enough we have a coalesced access to such a vector and a random access to memory is basically just a coalesced access at a basically fixed place where also caches work and everything. Um, yeah, this works because we don't have caching. And we, this way we can use this. Uh, use the data parallelism of the GPU properly. So what do we change at the, compared to the picture you saw before? We still have our system, but now we have a stack of systems here. And we still do the same domain decomposition because we still need to parallelize over these multiprocessors. So we do domain decomposition. We use the same tricks to uh, like the moving the origin here in order to suppress correlations that could arise from this type of decomposition. But then uh, at the second layer where we would need to go into these really tiny domains which we can't do with the large of states and we would need to cache. Instead, we um, treat our system as, part, as a set of vectors, basically, of uh, as a stack of systems. And then each of these uh, threads is just updating one system in the cell, and basically it's a larger cell from which it can select, basically. And we don't need to cache, again. Okay. Yeah, and that's basically illustrated what it looks like. You have this point, and each of these threads is treating just one point here. Um, okay, then another problem basically arises when we want to average over something, over, over independent samples, they need to be independent. If we always select the same sites, then that doesn't work uh, out really well because then the samples are correlated, it doesn't help. Um, so there are certain ways of decorrelating things. If we have domain growth and structure or phase ordering problems like the sports model which I showed in the beginning, then basically the uh, structure decorrelate the systems, the independent systems decorrelate by, um, by themselves basically because we start out with random initial conditions. So they are already decorrelated and they uh, evolve in different ways depending on the initial condition. So they um, then won't be correlated just by selecting obviously the same letter site in the same order in each system. Um, so that's um, the one thing. And in case of surface growth, we do have flat initial conditions. So if we run the same random number over, this, over the system several times, then we will always get the same result. That's not good. But there we can um, explicitly decorrelate them, for example, by like discarding, randomly discarding every second update, um, or basically a random fraction of the updates that we would perform. Um, uh, just as a, a side mark, um, in certain applications, which I talked about before, it's actually interesting to have the same evolution, same random numbers applied to a, to a large number of uh, copies of the system. For example, when you want to sample initial conditions, maybe you want to have different initial conditions, but then apply the same random numbers to all of them. Then this problem just doesn't exist. And if you want to calculate response functions, so you start with two systems which are rather similar, and then you then you need to evolve in exactly the same way. And then this is naturally a good match for doing these things because you don't even need to think about the decorrelation problem. Another thing is, for example, parallel annealing, where you do the same thing. Parallel annealing is something that is used for like um, for spin glasses, for example, and which is an interesting uh, problem, a set of problems, uh, because, it's interesting, because um, this is something where the D-Wave quantum computer, or kind of restricted quantum computer, is interesting for, because it kind of is supposed to be faster than simulated annealing in this regard. And a problem of benchmarking is actually to, well, 
compute hard problems and check what the actual ground, global ground state is to check if the uh, D-Wave is actually faster for these uh, certain hard problems. And so efficient implementation for these are needed. And some um, people also at the D-Wave company, for example, are working on similar things. Um, okay, back to the problem with the more states which we need. There's this alternative model basically where we just relax for the surface growth. Uh, we relax the condition. So we, uh, in our implementation, for example, we can do something where we have eight bits per lattice site, which is two times four bits for our um, slopes in x and y direction, uh, which even means that we can have four systems uh, packed into one 32-bit word. So each thread is not uh, processing one system, as I said initially, which the basic idea is, but in this specific case, we can uh, each thread can process four systems, which has the added advantage that when we want to decorrelate our systems and discard, randomly discard half of the updates, we don't need to actually have threads wait while they're discarding an update, but we can have um, our, um, basically just discard, two, just two, choose two of these um, systems to update and don't update the other two. Uh, it's basically just um, no presentation. I guess I will skip over this. And yeah, uh, this way we can um, basically yes, our threads can choose randomly two of these to update. And this is how computation remains dense, even though we discard update, updates. Um, yeah. And then another technical detail just. Um, for the random number call, um, generation, we need to select, randomly select lattice sites, but we um, own all the threads in our warp, at least, or in our thread block, are ex want to access the same lattice site at the same time. So we only need one random, random coordinate per cycle of our update, for, um, yeah, per step of our update cycle. And so in order to keep computation dense, we do uh, use um, a collaborative strategy of, between threads where um, we pre-compute a list of uh, update coordinates at one time, so we synchronize for that, and we store this list of random coordinates in shared memory, and then we then do our, list, uh, our updates. We actually just iterate, do our updates, and eat up this list until it's empty, and then after the list is gone, we went through the whole list, we refill the list doing another collective operation of all the threads, doing synchronization. Otherwise, actually, you don't need to synchronize in this um, setting because all the layers are completely independent, which is ideal for overlapping compute and data loading in the problem. Uh, so what's the performance of that? Looking at the uh, surface growth model, uh, you can see here this is the uh, Arthos implementation and you get like 11 billion update attempts per second. So actually, even though this is actually a more complex uh, problem here because we have more states, we can achieve higher performance than before with the um, basically simpler model. Um, the downside of this is actually that we, to achieve this, we are running 256 applications at the same time on the GPU. At least 256 applications. Uh, Application. 256 samples of our system, which means we need much more memory, basically. We need the memory that one run requires times 256. Um, uh, just as a comparison, if you compare this code to the completely sequential CPU implementation, uh, it gives you, you can roughly get a speed up of 100x. Uh, the reason we would compare this to a sequential CPU is because the sequential implementation is kind of the gold standard in terms of the reference. So that random sequential, sequential is kind of the actual thing. So you do get maybe tiny correlations when you do this, but this, for, this, um, the correlations you, for the correlations you get 100x speed up. Uh, if we do the stochastic cell automaton, we get like a 14x speed up over a fast CPU, same generation. So we're comparing a um, i7 4900 uh, via uh, to a Titan Black GPU, which is a Kepler generation. So like the previous previous generation, same for the CPU here. And yeah, then these are the systems with less, a few states, and then there are more systems we can imagine with. Uh, a large number of states, for example, the POTS model um, simulations, where, for example, this is an eight states POTS model, POTS model, so it also needs more bits per lattice site. And here you can see the performance um, of these POTS models, basically. It's a bit more complicated. It does do a metropolis update, needs to calculate uh, 
um, update, uh, lead to, leads to calculate Metropolis update probabilities. Um, so it's more compute bound than these actually, but still quite fast this is. Um, yeah. As I said, the main problem with this approach is you need a lot of memory uh, to do this because um, yeah, we run 256 samples, so we need for like a 2 to the 12 times 2 to the 12, so 2 to the 24 lattice sites, so like 16 million lattice sites, we need 4 gigabytes of memory, like 60 million lattice sites per realization <coughs> times 256 gives you at least 4 gigabytes of memory. And then some change for random number generator states and such. Uh, so I basically can run into limits there. If you want to have the simulation, like the simulations I showed here, this, uh, especially this 2 to the 16, the green line here in the early paper, which we could run on one GPU, with this method, we couldn't run it on one GPU because uh, two bits per letter side, 2 to the 16 times 2 to the 16, times 1024, which is the ideal size to fill up a GPU with this, would be uh, like one terabyte of memory, GPU memory we would need, uh, which is not possible to get on one GPU. Um, so, uh, yeah, but actually 1024 is not really not a number that of samples we wouldn't need because usually these uh, things which we published contain like 1024 or twice as many samples which are averaged over. So it would be nice to actually run this. Uh, and the obvious solution is spread it over multiple GPUs. Um, uh, okay, then I will just skip back to one small child mark. How did the beta thing turn out? Um, these are the simulations we did with this code on the R source model. Basically, we did the same simulation as in the, the publication which I showed you before. We just did the same thing on GPU and we ran 100 times longer, so 100 times more update steps. And you see that basically the thing that was published is about here, so that is about one quarter, but it's just a fine, but it's a fine time effect. If you go to longer times and you utilize your compute power, you see, okay, it goes down, back down again. To, still, to again agree with our um, old estimate. And oh, that's basically the advantage of also being to able to do this. Yeah, uh, in terms of conclusions, um, the main take home message uh, for you doing, not doing Monte Carlo things is basically when you think about when you want to implement something for a GPU, maybe also think about vectorizing the trivial parallelism which you may have in your application. So sometimes this can uh, lead to um, yeah, interesting results if you have the memory or if your single problems aren't too large and you can fit multiple problems on them. Just put them together instead of just having the batch system do this work for you. And this way you can use the GPU more efficiently. Um, we're currently working, or I'm currently working on a um, framework for this basically. Or the current code is already relatively um, flexible because it, kind of, it implements the surface growth, it implements POTS models in different ways. So it's a C++ code, highly templated uh, for n-dimensional uh, systems. And the important thing is working on a multi-GPU code because this is what makes it actually useful because then you're not limited memory anymore if you have access to a large, computer, large enough computer, like 100 GPUs for the one terabyte case. So, um, okay, and I want to thank my colleagues in Rosendorf and my collaborators. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention. So I was just asking if you can mm -hmm. estimate the effectivity of these uh, models in higher dimensions, three or four dimensions, uh, taking mm -hmm. into account the uh, restrictions of GPUs. Yeah, actually, um, the main restriction here is again memory. Uh, so if you go to higher dimensions, the main problem is, okay, what I have here, there's no 3D example here, uh, exactly plotted, but, um, and the thing about it, the only thing that changes if you go from the 2D case to a 3D case here, for example, for the POTS model or also for the R source doesn't matter. Um, the main thing that changes is that the computation of the update uh, site and the neighbor computation, because you have neighbor, nearest neighbor interactions or some neighbor interactions, uh, these become a bit more complicated because you add another dimension. So you have two more neighbors if you go one dimension higher and so on. Um, but it's actually not so much computation, especially like in the POTS case, the expensive thing is actually calculating the metropolis um, update probability because this contains an exponential function. Just calculating two more coordinates is really not that expensive. So basically the performance doesn't drop a lot. A lot. And also, um, 
a small weird thing about this because the POTS model code is not really optimized. The, uh, the con um, um, because I didn't have much time to look at the performance of this code. The way I know that it's not, not really optimized a lot is that actually the 3D POTS model is a bit faster than the 2D POTS model in this code. Uh, which shouldn't happen because it actually has to do a bit more, but then somehow the compiler seems to compile something differently in this case and it makes it faster. So there's probably room for optimization in the 2D case then. So yeah, not much expensive if you, can, if you have the memory basically because then your memory goes up exponentially. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Jeffrey.